Amen. And you're always able to give on uh, crowlersvillefirst.com slash donate. Uh, you can give that way as well, however you like to set that up um, as well. And uh, uh, this morning is actually is, is blessed to build, and we are so thankful. Like I said, you know, uh, we obviously a few months ago we, we paid off, you know, the loans that we had, and uh, we're, so we're thankful for that. And, uh, you know, we praise God because there's, because of your donations, there's been so, so many things that we've been able to take care of and fix and repair. And so thank you guys so much, you know, for, uh, for being faithful in your tithe and your offerings. Um, we uh, really do appreciate that um, as well. This morning I'm a little bit, uh, I don't want to say under the weather or not. Um, it's more or less it's uh, my allergies and everything else, plus the fact that I was taking prednisone. So the fact is, is that um, with the prednisone mixed with allergies, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a fun time right now. So if I'm, I've seen a little scattered brain for a moment, I apologize. I'm sorry. Like I said, we have our Bibles. We're in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. We've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes. We know, we see that obviously King Solomon has, has written this book. He's, he's the smartest man alive, you know, as far as, or sorry, he's the wisest man alive. Um, I wouldn't say he's the smartest man because there's some decisions that he makes that you go, eh, I don't know if that's really the smartest thing that you should have done. But he's definitely the wisest man. And so as he's gotten older in his age, he, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and he basically says, you know what, all this stuff that I've done, it's meaningless. You know, like all these things, apart from the fact of knowing God, it's all meaningless. And, you know, uh, we could sit there and get depressed when we read it. But the thing is, is that when we find Christ, when we, you know, when we, uh, you know, believe on the you know, Lord Jesus Christ, we realize that life has a lot more meaning. That our life, all of a sudden, we're going, okay, my life had no purpose, that I had no hope before Christ. And now that I've come to Christ, I have hope. I have a peace. I have, you know, the reason, you know, for it. And most people nowadays, it's a hard thing for them to understand because we live in a society and a culture that says basically, well, you know, that either, you know, that believe in evolution or something else that leaves them with no hope. There's no hope at all because, you know, according, you know, if we're going to go down the evolutionary path, it basically says that we're all animals and that, you know what, once we die, we die. How hopeless is that? It's just basically that your life has no meaning. Just go ahead. You know, as the Bible says, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you shall die. I mean, that's basically the point of view from the world. Solomon basically goes down that path and says, you know what, that's all meaningless. The only thing that really matters is that you love the Lord, is that, you, that you're saved and, and you're on your way to heaven. So let's read um, uh, chapter 6 of Ecclesiastes. It says this, verse 1. Man uh, to whom God uh, hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desires. Yet God gives him not uh, not power to eat thereof, but a, a stranger uh, eats it. This is vanity, and it is an evil a disease. If a a man beget a hundred children. Uh, be not filled with uh, with good, and also uh, that he has uh, he have no burial. I say that for he uh, for he comes in uh, in with vanity and departeth in in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor uh, nor known anything that uh, that hath more rest than the other. Verse six. Uh, though I, uh, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not go uh, to one place. All the, uh, the labor of the man is uh, for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For, uh, for what hath uh, the, uh, the wise more than the fool? What hath uh, the, uh, the poor than uh, that knoweth to walk before the living? Better is, is the sight of the eyes of that then mocking of the desire, this is also vanity and vexation of spirit. That which hath been is named already, and it is known that it is man. Neither may he uh, contend with him, uh, contend with him that is mightier than he. Seeing, uh, seeing there uh, be many uh, things that increase vanity, what is man the better? For he, know, uh, for who knoweth what is good for man in the uh, in this life, all the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For uh,
Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. You know, that is in your word. Lord, I pray that the seed of your word will fall upon fertile soil this morning, that we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. But I want to hear directly from you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you for a few moments. There's a, a trend uh, that's going on, and I'm going to get to you know, uh, what I mean by this, by the title of the sermon. Shout your inheritance. Okay? Continue in the book of Ecclesiastes today. Um, and last week, as we saw in Ecclesiastes you know, 5, we learned to not just let the word fly out of our mouths. We know that words should not be gushing out of our mouths, that words have meaning, right? You can't you know, just sit there and change the meanings of words and then expect people to understand what they are. But that's what we see in a culture, which is kind of, you know, is going to be ironic this morning because what we're going to talk about is a very, very heavy topic. I'm just going to tell you that right now this morning. It's going to be, a, you know, a very, very, um, you know, a, a heavy topic in the fact that people just think nowadays that they can just redefine words, they can just change the meaning of words, and that it's okay. And that's how, you know, that's how they go about changing certain things. That's how they, because then they can say things and get away with it without including what they actually, what is actually the truth. Because they can say they can say it without having to actually you know come out and you know and say the, the full thing, but what we'll see uh, you know this week in uh, six is that we will see that uh, that Solomon's going to mention you know some subjects that we've already discussed um, in the uh, book of Ecclesiastes from the previous chapter. So I'm going to I'm not going to say breeze by them, but I'm not going to necessarily stay you know uh, focused on on those verses because we've already talked about those, and I don't want to beat a dead horse. I don't want to get repetitive. I want to go on the ones that we you know uh, you know. Uh, that is newer in here. And so in verses 1 and 2, we see, you know, we read, it says, there's an evil which, is, which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men, a man to whom wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desires. Yet God gives him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eats it. This is vanity it is an evil disease. And so what we see on here is, I want us to realize, number one is, it, in this part where he's just talking about in these first few verses, it says what? That it is common among men. This is not an uncommon situation that he is talking about. It is very common. And so what he is you know, talking about is the fact that it's a common thing for a man to accumulate wealth, riches, no matter how much it is. You don't have to be a billionaire, trillionaire. You don't have to be like Elon Musk or whoever. But the fact is, is that in life, you will begin to accumulate wealth and you have all these things. And the thing is, is that as, you know, it's, it's funny because as you, you begin to, um, you know, get on into your life and everything else and you're able to afford the things that you want to be able to, you know, to, uh, to want, you, know, you want to be able to have, as you get older, you're not able to necessarily enjoy them. Because you spend your whole life trying to get you know, to the point where you can actually buy these things, but then, you know what, you're not able to enjoy it as much as you would if you were younger. Why? Because somebody else is going to enjoy it. Maybe it would be the grandkids, maybe it would be your kids, maybe it would be somebody else, but somebody else is going to enjoy it. And that's what uh, Solomon is talking about. He said, you know what, you're going to, you're, you're, you know, and Solomon had money. I mean, he was the richest man upon the earth. So he had all these things. He says, you know what, and so I don't you know, necessarily know if Solomon is, is uh, you know, is just down, you know, uh, down and saying that, you know, that he's not going to be able to uh, enjoy those things because he has money. Like I said, he is the richest man upon the earth, so he, he has those things. But a, as we know, we'll be able to, like I think about, like, you know, people that like old cars. They like old cars, but how many, how many of you know that an old car costs money? And usually, if you want to restore it, it costs a lot more than some of the cars that you can get nowadays, you know, that have all the technology and everything else, but people like older cars. Like, you know, I see, like, old trucks, like old Ford trucks, you know, kind of like the boxier style from, like, 1950, 1960, like those kinds, and I, I just love those trucks. I just, something about them, I just like them. And people say, well, you, that's because you see them in all the stores. Is that I've never had one. And the thing is that by the time that I would be able to afford to not only find a, you know, a, you know, a good body frame and all that kind of work on it, I'm going to be pretty old and probably you know, not going to enjoy it as much as if I had it, like, say, today. 
Okay? And so that's what a lot of times happens to people is that they, they go ahead, they, they strive for their whole life to get something, you know, a, new, you know, a, a certain boat that they want, a certain size house. They have all these things. And the thing is, is that when it comes down to it, they're going to keep on pushing forward, you know, trying to get that, but they're not going to be able to enjoy it as much as the next generation is going to. Okay? And so we see, and like I said, we see this and we hear this all the time, that someone will spend their lives accumulating wealth and riches only for their family or their friends to spend it. I mean, that's one of the you know, reasons why there is inheritance. And the Bible does talk about the fact that, that it is a good thing for somebody to have an inheritance to pass on to their children. Okay? You know, sometimes people say, well, no, I'm going to just take it all with me. Well, I was like, that's pretty selfish. I mean, what's it going to do with you in the coffin? I mean, other than it's going to just recycle and then somebody else is going to dig it up 100, 100, 200 years later and be like, oh, look, it, I, I found some money over here and be able you know, to go ahead and do that. But that's one of the things. And he says, you know, according to Solomon, this is, he says, this is vanity and it is an evil disease. Why? Because of the fact that people are trusting in their money. Brother Doug was talking about this morning as I came in is the fact of that when we begin to trust in our money, it is like a disease. Why? Because it's the love of money that is the root of all evil. And obviously, in any kind of disease, you're going to have you know, some sort of root that's going to, you know, uh, like if we begin to start loving it, it's going to, you know, it's going to bear root in our life. Like, and then it's going to become disease and everything else. And then our life is going to become, I mean, there's a reason why at Christmas time we have all these movies that come out, and it's all about giving. It's all about the fact of how somebody was, was mean. I mean, there's, there's a reason why you, know, uh, you can go around and you hear somebody call somebody Scrooge and somebody not even watch, you know, a Christmas character. Like, no. But then how do you know about Scrooge? It's because that character has transcended because there's always that person that we know that has all this money and they just hoard it to themselves. But then somewhere around Christmas time, because that Christmas spirit comes, you know, they can say, oh, the Christmas spirit's there. And all of a sudden they begin to, like, you know, want to give and everything else. Kind of makes you wonder if, like, January 1st, Scrooge went back to being mean. Do you ever think about that? Because he was nice, you know, to Tiny Tim and everything else. You know, around Christmas time, but it's like, oh, about a week later, I want that money back. Happen, but um, it's always a possibility. The next three verses, he talks about, it says in uh, verse 56, it says, if a man get a hundred children and, uh, and live many years, so uh, the days of his years be many, his uh, soul uh, be not filled with good and also that he uh that he have no burial i say that an untimely better than he for he becomes sanity and parts in darkness and his name shall be covered with darkness moreover he hath not seen the sun nor uh no this this hath more rest uh, uh, more rest than the other yea though uh yea though he live a thousand twice told he's seen do not all go to one place. And so what we need to, you know, probably want to focus on is the fact about talking about children. You say, well, how does, how could it be possible for a person to have a hundred children? Well, if we're talking about, I mean, there's two ways you can look at this. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. It's pretty easy, don't you think? I mean, he's pretty much a polygamist at this, you know, this point. Not right. It's not, you know, for people that sit there and say, well, Bible teaches that polygamy. Okay, no, God never says that, poly, you know, you know, uh, you know having Multiple wives and everything else is a good thing. That's, they did it, but that doesn't mean the Bible agrees with it. The Bible actually you know, condemns it and says that you shouldn't. You shouldn't. You know, that way. The other way would be the fact that, that he has you know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Because if you have you know, a large family, you come from a large family, and then they have, and they have, you, can have you can have 100 you know, children that way, right? And so... But according to you know the Bible and how as believers we should realize that having children is a blessing. I know that there are people out there that laugh and scoff and everything else about the fact that, you know they, they look at children as being a, you know a burden. They look at them as all kinds of things. I mean you know words that I can't even say. But they look at kids and I'm like, why did you have kids then? And the Bible does talk about the fact of them being a blessing. That, uh, and even in pagan nations. You know, ones that didn't believe the Bible back then, kids were a blessing. That's what's messed up about modern day America. Is that you even had like nations 
heathen nations that said the same thing about children, that said that they were a blessing. Why? Because, you know, they got to keep their bloodline going, they got to, you know, all that kind of stuff. Plus the fact if you're on a farm, I mean, Matt knows this. If you have more kids, if you have kids and stuff like that, I mean, what do they do? You know, they can come out there and help you, uh, you know, take care of that farm later on. You know, maybe when, um, you know, Matt's not able to, you know, move as well, you know, he's like, all right, Samuel, get up on that tractor. But that's one of those things is, is that um, having kids, you know, is a blessing. And I know that, you know, it, I'm not saying it's not. Life that you got to try and keep alive, right? And some days, you know, you, uh, some days, you know, that will, you know, have an attitude going, man. But it's always worth it. It is always worth it. It is the fact that um, we need to realize that in a modern America, the fact is, is that the ideology is, is that children are not a blessing. Do you realize that if, we, if there's no kids, then pretty much all of, you know, all of humanity just dies out? If you stop having kids, what happens? Nothing. And then, you know, civilization. People look at it as, because um, the government has made it kind of like strange that you know that we see kids as being in America as being a necessary evil. I was watching this one video where a guy referred to children. I'm going to get into this a little bit more, and this is you know the heavier part about it is the fact that he looked at as a child in a mother's womb as a parasite. And I was like, wow. But here's the thing is, and I'm just going to get right into it because, like I said, this is you know, the, the, the heavier part of the whole thing. Because there's the whole thing, you know, that if you go down on I-55 right now, there's at least two signs, you know, coming back from Cape and going to Cape that talk about shouting your abortion. That sickens me, honestly. It sickens me because of the fact is that there's no, no regard for life. And somebody says, well, it's my body, my choice. Well, do you realize that, and we're going to do a little bit of biology here this morning, but do you realize that, you know, that when a sperm cell, you know, go, it uh, goes in and fertilizes the egg cell, that all of a sudden that, you know, when that happens, the DNA becomes its own? It's its own individual person. It's not the fact that we're No, it's at the moment when that sperm cell goes into the egg cell and that becomes a, a person. It's life is at conception. They, they can take that out. They can look at it. It is that DNA does not. Different. And so we need, we need to realize, as God's word says, that a prior thing it says, uh, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are, are their fathers. That the fact is, is that abortions is not about the fact, abortions is, is, is about the fact of somebody not wanting to con- control themselves, and then pay, uh, and then make somebody else pay for their mistake. It's getting quieter. I told you it's going to be a heavier subject this morning. Here's the thing, and the, the Bible talks about that. We look throughout the Bible, we'll see genealogies all the way through the Bible. Different ones that like this person begat, this person begat, this person begat, this person. Do you know why that's there? There's two reasons, you know, mainly. It's one thing, obviously, to show, you know, to show, you know, you know uh, the lines of families, right? But it's also the fact to show that how God had blessed his people. Before I get all the way deep into the fact of about abortion, I want to talk to you, you know, uh, just a, a moment here because he does talk about this. He says, that uh, also that, they, that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. What I want to talk to you, you know, for this before I get back into the other part is, is the fact about you know, burial and what he's talking about here. He's, you know, he's speaking about the fact that obviously about you know, burial and there's a big, you ever hear somebody say, well, I can't, you know, like there's a big argument between like whether or not you get buried in the ground or you get cremated? Do you know why Christians, you know, uh, you know, uh, all throughout time have said burial instead of cremation? Because some people say, well, cremation's cheaper. There's actually a reason for it. 
The reason why Christians are to be buried and not cremated, you know, uh, is this. When a believer dies in the Bible, it always, for one thing, speaks of the burial, not cremation. When it does talk about cremation in the Bible, it talks about the heathen nations. Okay? When Elijah dies, they put his body in the earth, in the tomb. Stephen, when he is stoned to death, he is buried. When King Saul is, you know, uh, dies, he is buried. I mean, I'm not going to go through every single circum, you know, every single uh, person in there, but believers were buried in the Bible, and what it was is it's symbolic of what Jesus Christ did for us. It was the death, burial, and resurrection, and that we are to be like Christ even uh, you know, even in our death. That's why the Bible, you know, that's why Christians throughout time have. even on to death, and not, you know, um, represent. I mean, if we think about it, if we're supposed to represent Christ in a burial and resurrection in honor of death, we're supposed to be buried, right? What does the other side, if somebody's cremated, what does that symbolize? It would be symbolizing where they're going, if they're heathen, which would be hell. That's the, that's the symbolism, you know, that it's supposed to be. Now, if, you know, if you had somebody that was cremated, all of a sudden, you know, guys are like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know where those ashes went. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the fact is, is that, you know, that we should want to, um, you know, represent Christ in every area of our life. Am I saying a person is going to go to hell, you know, like a Christian is going to go to hell because they were cremated? No. Why? Because you can't lose your salvation, only not on the fact of you being cremated. But pagan, uh, pagan uh, religions like Hinduism and you know, the Greeks back then in the Bible, they would burn the dead. They would actually celebrate you know, burning bodies and everything else. And we're not to be like the, you know, the heathen. We're not you know, like to be And so when he goes on, it says an untimely bird is better than he. What he is you know, referring to is in fact uh, a miscarriage. We talked about this a few weeks ago, is the fact that, you know, he's referring to a miscarriage. Because why? Because, when, you know, maybe he's miscarried or anything else, where do they go? They automatically go to heaven. Because the baby is born innocent, they, they haven't sinned yet, they haven't gone, despite what Calvinists say that there are, you know, little babies who would murder you if they had the chance to. Which I don't know where they get that in the Bible. But the thing is, is that they, uh, and so... It, that's what he's saying in this thing. He's saying, you know what, it's better for this person, you know, it would have been better for them to, be, uh, to have been miscarried than for them actually to, like, you know, uh, been born. And this is the reason why he makes that statement about Judas. Judas, in, uh, uh, in Mark chapter 14, verse 21, it says, The Son of Man indeed goeth, and as it is written of him, but woe unto that man, speaking of Judas, by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for, the, uh, for if... He ended up going to hell because of it, because of his choices. But he's basically saying, you know what? It would have been better for Judas not to have been born. Why? Because he would have gone to heaven. And obviously, you know, that God's word says that he is not willing for any should perish. Now, am I, uh, in, along those same lines, am I saying that a is okay? No. This is different than an abortion. Abortion is killing the baby. A miscarriage is that you know, the baby uh, couldn't survive you know on its own and ended up you know ended up you know passing on anyway you know ended up passing on and there's some there's some Christians out there who go well, it's okay abortion is fine because they get to go to heaven it's like no I mean what person in the right mind would say it's okay for you to kill your baby and then you'll hear all the the arguments all the all the fluff of words all the redefining of definitions about what it means. They're like, oh, they're not actually killing the baby. Yes, they are. I have uh, stuff here. I have a stack, actually. If I'll go through it all. Namely, one of them is, is how they actually do it. And if I tell you how they actually do it, and that does not scare you and uh, cause your st stomach to be churned, there's something wrong with you. I'll tell you the most common way that they do it. If, you know, if they're like in their second trimester and they're going second, third uh, trimester, what they will do is they will, you know, they will, uh, they will go into, uh, they will go in, inside the mother, 
grab the baby, and they will begin to rip the baby apart. Tear it apart, rip it apart. And they say, well, a baby can't, you know, feel. Or, sorry, a fetus can't heal, uh, you know, feel. That's what That's why they call it abortion. They don't call it killing your baby. Because that way he feels a little bit better about it. So they rip it apart, and then they use a vacuum, and they still up. I was uh, informed about this, and you know, maybe I heard it before or whatever, but I was informed about this, is that they will actually have a, you know, a, fertilized, you know, a fertilized egg. They will grow it in a lab, keep it alive long enough, so let them down there are different stages in, the, in that outside of the body of a woman, and then when they need a certain part from that fetus, from that baby, they will cut it off, rip it off, wherever they have to do, and then they just kill the baby off. This is that it should almost make you sick. I mean, it should make you sick. Your stomach. That people are so callous, you know, towards humanity. The funny thing is, is that if you were to do that to some endangered species of animal, you would be like that, like like you're some sort of monster. But yet you do it to a child, to a baby, it's okay. Because that's just a fetus. That's just a lump of cells. Well, let me, tell you, let me say this to you. You're a lump of cells. And nobody's coming in here trying to kill you or shoot you or do anything else and try to rip off your arm because they need it. So leave the babies alone. You go after the, you know, the most innocent of, you know, the most innocent of, of human beings. One that can't even, you know, uh, one that can't even defend itself. And the reason why the person called it a parasite is because, well, you know, it's because they can't defend themselves and, and whatever, and they're always just wanting mom and everything else. Animals do that. Animals take care of their young, so why is it wrong for a human? Are we that, are we that naive, you know, and that sick of a culture that we sit there and it's okay for an animal to take care of its young, but yet a human, if they take care of it, is somehow wrong? The fact is, is that if we were to go up, you know, uh, some endangered animal and go in there and put that, you know, say like a polar bear, I don't know, they're always talked about on the news. And they were to put that thing asleep and they were to go in there and rip that baby polar bear apart in the mother's womb. Oh my goodness. I mean, there was more, you know, a few years ago, there was more about Humbay, that, that ape, about what happened to him than there was about the kid. And I'm not saying that we go around and start shooting animals and doing whatever. I'm just saying the fact is, is that we got our priorities mixed up when we, we think that an animal is worth more than a human being. I mean, it's just, I haven't even gotten into the part that's actually going to get me you know, really excited. Let's look at this, you know, the, the part about, you know, like I said, I didn't even get into the abortion part. I'm going to right now. This is, by, you know, by the way, I'm going to read this portion right here. It's actually from the Catholic Church. So if you think that you know, Catholics are all about right to life and everything else, they're not. It says, abortion must be, remain legal. I mean, right there, that ought to tell you that they're not right. It says, if only because of the very large number. And the, I'm going to stop right here for a second. This is not you know, to be a, like a condemnation thing. I'm not saying that if a person has had one that there's no forgiveness in that because, yes, God can forgive you. Why? Because most likely, because uh, nowadays, most are taught in ignorance. They're told one thing, which is actually not the truth. But, the, uh, you know, but you, can get, you, know, you can receive forgiveness from the Lord. I want you to know that. But I want you to also you know, realize that you know, the way that they manipulate and, uh, and redefine terms. Okay, so this is a, you know, from a, a Catholic website. It says abortion must remain legal if only because of the very large n- uh, number of pregnant women whose lives are directly or seriously threatened by, uh, by their fetuses. When has a fetus threatened a woman? Oh, they're talking about the fact that the baby, you know, baby can possibly kill her. I understand that. We'll get to, the, we'll get to all the little arguments of, you know, that they make. Well, what about the endangerment of the woman during childbirth? We'll get to that. And that in that myth that they you know, they put out there about that, and it says, and because of the thousands of women who become pregnant because of rape and incest, we're going to get to that one every year. These are all like you know fallacies you know that they come up with, 
Additionally, many older women need an abortion because they have an extremely high percentage of deformed fetuses. In this entire thing, who is God? They have put man in the area of God and saying, who deserves to live and who, who deserves to die? If it's meant to be that, you know, uh, that a child is born and they have some sort of physical you know, deformity, so what? That child has every right to live as you do. So here's one of the things. This is from CNN. I'm going to hit a wide variety of different ones. Why do women get an abortion? We always hear the rape, incest, mother dying during childbirth, but there's some other ones. They say, well, the child wouldn't live to term. Doctors have no idea. That's a doctor's guess. But why don't you let you know, nature take its course, let you know, what God has, and say, you know what, let's see. Because there's been many stories that I have heard where a doctor has told someone, well, your child is not going to live to term, and, they're, uh, and if they do, they're going to be severely retarded, or they're going to do whatever, and all these things. And then what, you know what happens? They end up giving birth, and the child is normal. Doctors are human. They don't know. They're not God. They're not all-knowing, all-seeing, all, you know. So let it be. Number two was this. She wasn't ready for more children. There's, there's ways, you, you know what? There's ways that that doesn't happen. One would be, and I know there's kids in here, but one would be the fact that, you know, that you don't come together, you know, you know, like you are, you know, in a marriage bed. And one of the ways that they talk about on here is, you know, Margaret Sanger, who was the one that, who started the whole abortion movement and everything else. She was along the line and says, you know what, people should be able to just go around there and have fun, be able to basically jump, in, jumping in and out of bed. That's, you know, what the Bible calls that. The Bible refers to that as a whore. Number three is this: her uh, her birth control failed. That actually is more, you know, a, a true because if you read the box, the box only says it's like 95% effective. But if she wasn't sleeping around, that wouldn't happen. All these people want to go out and they want to do something and they want to have a consequence. And then when they do have a consequence, they want to make the child pay for it. Number four, she shouldn't have to explain her decision. She's going to have to explain it because she's going to stand before God and God's going to ask her why. Number five, she was raised in an abusive household. I don't understand this one. Just because you were raised in a piece of household does not mean that it's like, okay, now I just can kill whoever I want to kill. I mean, if that's the case, why do we put murderers in, you know, in prison? Serial killers. Oh, they had an abusive household. We shouldn't put them in there because they had an abusive household. No. Everybody makes their own decisions. Okay. Here's the, here's the statistic for those, because they always say rape and incest. Got to have that possibility. By the way, if a child is conceived in rape and incest, doesn't that child still have the right to be born? And they say, well, you know, she has nine months of shame. Nine months is a whole lot different than 80 years of, of regret. And nobody said that, you know, she felt so guilty or whatever, or she felt so shameful that she couldn't give up that child for an adoption. That child has every right to live. Every right. But here's the statistic. 1%, by the way, this is, um, this is from CNN. So don't think that I'm just cherry-picking the, you know, the, the articles I want. 1% of women obtain an abortion because they became pregnant through rape. 1%. And less than a half a percent because of incest. So don't sit there and say, well, we need to have it because of those cases. If it happens that way, obviously that's not the way that God intended it, what God wanted it to happen, but that child has a right to live no matter what. That child did not choose the circumstances in which they were conceived. Here, if you were you know, conceived in you know, rape or incest, wouldn't you still want to be here? And that's, I'm putting it nicely. She started the Negro Project in 1939. Sorry, this is now known as Planned Parenthood. 
They changed the name. They thought it might be a little bit too offensive, but they kept on calling it the Negro Project. So can you understand where they're coming from as far as wanting you know, abortions? I would say, you know, if you're calling a project the Negro Project you know, and, and how to kill black children, that would make you a racist, wouldn't it? Or she said this, this is a direct quote. We don't want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Uh, population. She's a racist, though. And yet, in 2021, the vast majority of abortion clinics have denounced Margaret Sanger because of the controversy you know, around her racist comments saying, you know what, we don't necessarily agree with her, but we still want your money. In 1926, if you don't think that she was, you know, she's racist or not, Sanger was also the featured speaker at a women's auxiliary meeting of the Ku Klux Klan of Silver Lake, New Jersey. No, she's not racist. She also, I mean, it wasn't just, you know, it wasn't just, you know, uh, you know black people. It, it was anyone that she figured, that she deemed was not, uh, not worthy of living. Because uh, uh, right here we have quote from her she once wrote that the aboriginal uh, australian is the lowest known species of human family just a step higher than the chimpan uh, chimpanzee in brain development and has so little sexual control that police authority alone prevents him from obtaining sexual satisfaction on the streets so she has such little uh, care for for people she would go along the lines of saying you know what if you are in a um, if if you are in a, uh, a poverty stricken area, you should be put to death. The same line of teaching that actually Adolf Hitler did, because Adolf Hitler said. Those were the that's the pure race. According to Adolf Hitler, which is funny because Adolf Hitler was like, you're saying that you're like evil and wicked and that they should kill you, but no, you can't because you've got to be the leader for it. But Margaret, Margaret Sanders says that um, I don't think it's still a racist thing or a, a, you know, uh, goes on you know, wealth is the fact that the, the 80% of Planned Parenthood facilities are located in minority neighborhoods. Eighty percent of them. It says although only thirteen percent of Ameri American women are black, over thirty five percent are of all black babies are aborted in the United States every year. So you have thirteen percent of you know American women are black, and out of that thirteen percent, thirty five percent of them are aborted. According to Students for Life of America, more African Americans have died from abortion than from AIDS, accidents, violent crimes, cancer, and heart disease combined. Black babies are more likely to be aborted than whites. On Halloween 2017, Planned Parenthood's Black Community Twitter account tweeted, a black woman and it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to carry a, a pregnancy to term or give birth what are they saying you're not worth it your child's not worth it they want to play god here's the thing is is that when we look at these, you know, uh, all these different areas is this is what one of the her ideologies is is that a large portion of women in the country began uh, utilizing a form of contra uh, contraception at a young age in order to enjoy the pleasures of sex without worrying about having to halt one's education or career in order to be a mother. In other words, what are they promoting to you? They're saying that if you're a stay-at-home mom, that you're somehow you know, less of a woman because of the fact that you want to stay at home and teach your ki uh, kids and take care of the home, like the Bible says. I'm not denying that. My wife is smarter than I am. How do I know that? 
Go ask her what her GPA was in, you know, in college and ask her what you know, mine was. Hers was like a 3.95. Mine was a you know, 3.4. She's smarter than I am. I'm not denying that. But don't you think that you know, it might be a good idea for, uh, for ladies that, you know, in the fact that like how the Bible teaches that you should stay at home. Why? So you could teach your children so that they're smart? What's, what's the old saying? The, the hand that rocks the cradle is what? Is it going to lead the next generation, right? So, some of them on those lines? That's how God, you know, that's how God has it. Now, could I, and people say, you know, come out all the time. Well, a woman can do anything a guy can do. Yes, I agree. Well, a guy can't get birth, I'll tell you that. I don't care, you know, what, how they try to, you know, uh, they, they try to frame that nowadays, but they, it's not true. Yes, a woman can do just, you know, same thing as a guy's, but you know what? God has given certain roles, and he says that you shouldn't have to. God says, you know, there's roles for women and there's roles for men. And right now they, they try to blur it. Why? They try to make it sound like somehow that the ladies were being oppressed because they stayed at home with the children. And we see how well that's working, don't we? Our society is all messed up, isn't it? By the way, since 1973, which is right around time you know, with Roe versus Wade, this is an estimate, there has been an estimated 64,443,118 abortions. And that's a, an estimate because you look at one uh, gut mocker who, uh, who does, uh, does the estimates and then you do the CDC and they're like off by a little bit. So that's why, you know, uh, you know, why I say an estimate. So 64 million people ceased to exist, you know, uh, were murdered because of that as well. She was into, she studied. Let's see, I'm going to go back and make sure that I get this right because I don't want somebody to come out and say, no, that's not true. All right. Her main things, because of the fact that, you know, obviously, she, you know, she's a racist, uh, racist, she was also into eugenics. Eugenics is the study of how to arrange reproduction within a human population to increase the occurrence of uh, heritable traits. Does this not sound like Adolf Hitler? That she wants a certain race, you know, th that is dominant over. This is what she wants. This is how she thought. This is how she believed. And so when we look at, you know, these things, you know, like, I'm going to, I'll go through, like I said, I already talked about, you know, a couple of the, the techniques that they use in order for abortion. If you ever want to watch something that's very, it's not a happy film, let's just put it that way, but it is very, very, you know, irrelevant and whatnot, please don't watch it with your children. It's called Unplanned. That movie is actually about somebody who was pro-abortion, was all about it, said babies didn't feel anything, did all this other stuff. And then they actually the womb. And it's not a my body, my choice, because like I said earlier, they have different DNA. It's a totally different person in, the, uh, you know, in there. So people that say my body, my One of the other ones is partial birth abortion, where they, they actually have the baby come out, you know, the head come out, they stop the abortion, or sorry, they stop the, the birth. The scissors in the back of the head and then suck the brains out. Yes, very lovely. They actually want to do it now to where you can decide up to 30 days afterwards whether or not you want to keep that baby or not. So you can go home with that baby, feed it, and everything else. It's not alive until 30 They want to do. Then they have other ones. You know, uh, they have birth control pills. Uh-oh. The pastor is going to start talking about birth control pills. This is, from, uh, this is from the University of Chica uh, Chicago. It says this report represents the uh, uh, talking about the fact of
2021, based on the data of the National Vital Statistics Systems, a uh, maternal death is defined by the World Health Organization as the woman, uh, sorry, the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy. Did you see how they changed it? It's not the fact that the woman's pregnant during, during childbirth she died. It's the fact of that, you know what, you can have an abortion, and within those 42 days, if you die because of that abortion, that's considered to be you died during childbirth. Change the definition because that way it ups their statistics because it is more likely that you're going to, there's, you know, numerous cases where a woman has gotten, um, has gotten an abortion and she's bled out. Why? Because of the doctors being reckless. Bled out. Ruptured. Had heart attacks. Blood clots. All this stuff from having an abortion. But that's how they define it. If they were to, you know, said the death of a woman while pregnant, that's one thing. But notice that, or within 42 days of the termination of pregnancy, which means, you know, killing your baby, um, irrespective of the duration and the site of the pregnancy for any cause related to or ag- uh, aggravated by the pregnancy or its management, but not from, ex- but not from accidental or incidental, incidental occurrences. I like how they put accidental or incidental. It's the same thing that they're doing. It's the same thing that they're saying is the fact they're sick and twisted because, it, you know, they say, you know what? We're not only, I can guarantee the number that they have for moms that die during childbirth is severely low. You know, and, and that's how they redefine it. It's the same way when you're, well, we're looking at the, uh, the birth control pill. Because they'll say, stops pregnancy. Do you know how they define it? All right. So we, as Christians, we say life begins at conception. When that sperm cell and that egg cell, you know, is fertilized, that's the start of life. They change it. They move the goalpost a little bit, and they say, well, it's, it's not that. It's when the fertilized egg attaches itself to the uterus wall, which that could be you know, that could be several days to a week before that happens. And so what does birth control do? Attach itself. You say, well, that's not a problem. Yes, it is. Because either the, the birth control pill will cause a chemical, uh, a chemical burn reaction, basically burning the baby inside. That, that small baby to starve to death. That's what birth control does. But that's not what they tell you. Because they move the goalpost to redefine what pregnancy is. That's what they always do. When I say always, it's, you know, and I can sit there and, you know, say government and whatever. No, it's always, you know, the wicked ones because they want to be able to get through it. And it really saddens me, but yet angers me when I hear somebody say, shout your abortion, and somebody has like the number up there, you know, the, I mean, one would, you know, would irritate me. One would sicken me, but I see one's out there, 21, 23. I want to say, you know what, you're not shouting your abortion, you're shouting that you're a hoe. Because I can guarantee it's not with the same guy. You haven't figured it out. I'm pretty blunt and straight to the point. I don't sit there and pull punches. But according to them, they go on and say, they said in 2021, 1,205 women died from maternal causes in the United States compared to 861. What are they doing, though? They're not included. When they say that it's from childbirth, it's not from childbirth. It's from childbirth and a botched abortion. continually keep on putting stuff on there that's not true. Now, here's the thing. When they say that, you know, a, uh, you know uh, when women, you know, actually do die from childbirth, actual childbirth, this is from CNN. Four out of five women. Vastly dropped if you actually look at the statistics and know
Because, you know, obviously we have better health care than we did before. We have better, you know, methods now. So, so the fact of rape, incest, and, you know, death during, uh, you know, death during childbirth are all lies. But they always want to put those out there because they think, well, that's not gonna, you know, a rape or an incest, that's going to traumatize a woman. Yes, it would. And they don't, when it comes down to birth control, they don't want to tell you what actually birth control actually does. That a chemical burns, you know, uh, you know, the poor baby to death. Or it causes the fact of them starving to death. Because I guarantee that if, if any of the pro-choice places came out and said that to you, there would be a far less abortions. But here's the biggest thing. If you don't sleep around, you have nothing to worry about. Sex is not something to, you know, to do as a recreation. Be like, hey, I got nothing else to do. Let's just go out and fool around. God has always defined that, you know, that that happens within the marriage bed. Within the marriage bed. That you be married. Why? Because that way you actually you know, make a life commitment, uh, commitment to the person instead of, yeah, I love you for about five more minutes. Oh, yeah, I love you, baby. All right, I got to go. Thanks. And they're gone. Stem cell research is a whole other thing, too. That's actually, you know, the part that I was referring to about the fact of them, like, growing embryos and everything else, and then they cut off the parts that they want, and then they use that for research. <clears throat> I'm going to end with this. Two main reasons for abortion. It's money and politics. That's it. So, well, Pastor, you know, why you got to you know, preach politics? Because that's, uh, that's what it's, it's a part of. And I'm here to tell you that all the stuff that they, you know, they tell you about all this stuff, I mean, you can find any of this stuff online. I just looked it up last night and found it. It's not like, a, you know, if you know what you're looking for, you can find it. Our government funding of Planned Parenthood has increased every year since at least 2000. Do you know the reason why? There's a reason why they, they like abortion. Because where else can you go and be supplied with what you need, you know, the material of what you need to do your things for free? In other words, where can you, you know, where else can you go and say, you know what, I need That's essentially what it comes down to. But what are they using for? have used that you aborted fetal cells not only just okay this sickened me when I found this they use it in food your drink makeup they use it in those things somebody said you know, and they said, you know, they said why do you put it in makeup well, you know fetal cells don't have life for our makeup so dead babies, it helps you stay younger. They put it in your food you want to help it taste better. And you have to find out what those restaurants are. I'll tell you one, Nestle. Nestle you know, puts it in there as a preservative to make it taste better and everything else. He said, how's it taste? I don't know. I, I'm not a like, person who would sit there and try and say, I think I want to you know, put a you know, dead baby in here and see how it tastes. But they also use it in vaccines. I know, this is, I, I know that you're, you know, there's ones out there going, man, I'm just, oh, that's just a jerk. But I'm telling you the truth. Do you know who like, one of the biggest backers of Planned Parenthood is? Johnson and Johnson. Oh, big shock there. They have to use aborted fetal cells inside of vaccines in order to make your body accept them. 
They put all kinds of junk in them. Then they put the dead or live virus because they could say, well, it's just a dead virus. I don't care if you're putting a dead or live virus. You're not putting that in my body. Then they put the aborted fetal cell in there. Why? To have your body help accept it. Then they put some sort of animal DNA in there because they, they figure, hey, we all evolved from monkeys, so we got to put some, some animal DNA in there to help along with that. Then they put like a bunch of metals in there. Why? Because once you put like mercury or any of those kind of metals, it's, you know, they change it. They put a metal in there. Why? Because then your body goes, hey, there's a foreign substance in, you know, in here, and we got to go attack it. So then when, all the, you know, when, when those things come, they come over, they see the, you know, the foreign thing, you know, the foreign substance, and then it begins to uh, detach and, and do all these things. Vaccines in and of themselves actually make people sicker. If you look up the history of vaccines, vaccines themselves, and this is not even a sermon, I'm not even talk, I wasn't even going to talk about vaccines, but vaccines, if you look at the history of it, have made people you know, sicker than if, they, than if they don't get them. You could do whatever you want. You want to go out and get a vaccine, go ahead. It's not a salvation issue. You go ahead. But the fact is, is that if you say, you know what, I don't care that they're putting the border pieces in there, blah, 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 then go ahead. I don't care. I mean, you know, you, you do what you want to. I can't sit there and hold your hand and say, no, don't do that. I'm not your mom or dad. It'd be kind of weird, though, especially if I'm going up with like... I tried with Rick, but he just smiled. But here are some of the, the biggest backers of Planned Parenthood. J.P. Morgan Chase, Johnson & Johnson, Nationwide, Prudential Financial, American Express, Bank of, uh, Bank of America. And that was, in, that was in August of 2006, so obviously there's things that have changed you know, on that one. That's the, this is the newest data that I could find. Because I think now they, they've actually started to like, hide all these things because they don't want people to actually know who's doing it and who's not doing it. But some of the people, uh, some of the main, uh, who, where, where was that one? Some of the main people that have backed it. Was Bill Gates? Gee, I wonder why. You also had um, uh, Hillary Clinton was one. These are all things that are out there. It's not something I'm making up. It's not some sort of conspiracy theory. This is like public knowledge. George Soros was one. These are names that you always hear in the media no matter what. You know, they just keep coming up and you're like, oh, that's conspiracy theory. No, when they, you follow the money, you'll find them. Warren Buffett. All these ones have, you know, contribute, give money to it. Why? Because they're making money. I mean, how does, how does Bill Gates, a software guy, all of a sudden go, I think I'm going to go into medical. I did hear a funny joke about that. They said, well, he couldn't get, you know, he couldn't get a virus off of Windows, so what makes me think that he's going to get a, a virus out of my body? But they all, have, they all have, you know, money in the pot, and they're going, you know what, how can I make more money? And they don't care. But if you actually look at the whole reasons behind all of it, Margaret Sanger said that she felt like the human race was being overly populated. Populate. Bill Gates has come out and said the same thing. Needed to. You know, to them, that, you know, that is expendable. And so that way they can have everything here. So we look at these things, like I say, I know this is a, a, a heavy subject. So okay with it. Like it's, like it's almost like you're going to go get your teeth cleaned. Like that's the like whole thing. Oh yeah, I'm going to get an abortion. I'll be back on three. Like it's nonchalant. But this is what the Bible says. I mean, we need to realize, if you say that, you know what, that, you know, a fetus in the womb, if you want to call it that, you know, I say a baby in the womb, a fetus in the womb is not a baby. Well, let's look at what the Bible says, because the Bible talks about it, and you know what, that's my final authority. Luke chapter 1, verse 40, uh, 41 and 43 says, And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her, uh, in her womb, and uh, 
Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she uh, spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is uh, the fruit of thy womb. Whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? This is John the Baptist leaping. Oh, yeah, that lump of cells, it's able to leap inside of a, you know, inside of a mother's womb. That big clump of cells. Or Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I knew thee in, uh, in the belly, I, I knew thee. Sorry, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before uh, thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And And he knows what he's called you to. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every single person that is listening this morning. And it wasn't the fact of you know that you should uh, decide to take you know decide to kill somebody. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14 says this, For thou hast uh, uh, possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully God knows who you are. You are not an accident. God didn't say, you know, oops, I, I messed up when I did that one. I knew I shouldn't have been watching TV when I, you know, uh, when I created this one. No, God knows who you are, has a purpose in your life, and the thing is that the Bible says that he has not let any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And like I said, the Lord can forgive you if you've had an abortion. He can forgive you. And I end with this. Psalm 127, verse 3. As I said earlier, the title of the sermon is Shout your inheritance. I start from this verse. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are not a necessary evil. They are a blessing. They are an inheritance. And the Bible you know, it tells us basically not be looking you know, uh, to get rid of them or to kill them off. Some say, well, I, I don't know if I can handle 10 kids. It's kind of up to you, isn't it? I've met people, you know, they, you know, they, they have kids outside of wedlock and everything else, and they come up. And say, I'm glad that you kept the baby alive, instead of trying to like, you know, like quote unquote hide your quote, your mistake that you say that you that you made. We all make decisions. We all make choices that you know. What well, sometimes we wish we can go back and change, and we have regret for them. but at least you didn't take it out on your child. You know, the Bible says that you should get married and you, and you have kids. You know the reason why the Bible tells you to get married? Because if you're married, you know, uh, before the Lord is because of the fact that you say, hey, you know what, I like this person, I'm going to stay with them the rest of my life. And you don't have the drama that you would have if you have like 50 baby mamas. Because guys, if you're going around sleeping around with all these, you know, all these women, and you have all these kids, you got to pay. Or ladies, you know, if you end up having, you know, all these different babies by different dads and stuff like that. I mean, yes, I'm glad that you kept them, but you have drama. Well, you know why? Because you know something's going to happen to where you know, like. Somebody's going to get mad at somebody else and somebody, whatever. But if you're in a marriage and that's the only person that you're with, you got to deal with that one person, not 50 people. Or in the case of Solomon, where he had 700 wives and you know, 300 concubines. It's a matter of, you know, of choice on this. And like I say, you know, I know that this wasn't going to be the happiest sermon that I preached. But I, would, uh, I felt like it, would, you know, it definitely would be eye-opening because I think there's a lot of people that just take what you know, media says or what people say or what Planned Parenthood says or what these things, and they take that as gospel truth, and they never look at what God's word actually says or they never look at what they're not saying. That's what you need to realize, that when you're reading something from like, you know, the government or somebody that's wicked, realize what they're not saying. 
Because that's where they get around the whole fact of saying, well, we're not terminating a pregnancy with a, with a birth control pill. Because they redefined what pregnancy was. Pregnancy, us, from conception. Them, it has to, you know, you have to wait until the uterus is, uh, you know, is attached. That's it. Make sense? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And that is something that, um, that you know, can be hard to deal with. But Lord, we know that your word talks about everything. It talk, you know, and it shows us, it leads, it guides us, it directs us. but doers of the word. And so, Lord, I, I pray for that person that, you know, that is, that is listening right now that maybe has had an abortion and they have this big amount of regret. I know I can, you know I can't do it on my own. And Lord, for anyone, you know, for others that have heard things and they go, man, I just never realized. Lord, I pray that they would uh, not only obviously follow that, but also share that with others. So that we Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to leave you with one last thought. About a month ago, we, you know, we were always told to remember 9-11, right? And we think about that, and we, we get the images of the Twin Towers in our head. But what I wanted to tell you is, but the same amount of people that died in the, you know, in the Twin Towers on 9-11 is the same amount of children that were murdered just yesterday. Day. Let me pray and we'll dismiss. I pray that you would be with them, Lord. I pray that they would share the gospel with someone this day and throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen.